recording. Am I loud enough? Is that coming out good, uh, good and clear? Yes, that's good. Okay. Good. So good afternoon, everyone. This is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I run the Forest Connect program. One of our activities is to host a monthly webinar series, and uh, it's my uh, benefit to have access to great speakers such as Baron. Baron's been a webinar presenter a couple times before, has always had very good presentations, and I contacted him, and he's offered to talk today. And so Baron is a, a professor in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell, works on a variety of different projects related to the management of natural resources, plants, animals, insects, and worms. And so today Baron is going to be talking about setting the stage for a brighter future and how to create thriving woodlands. So Baron, welcome and thank you. And I'm going to mute my microphone and turn it all over to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for everybody who's out there uh, in different time zones, as I recognize. Um, I'm going to try to deliver some rather simple messages to a complicated problem that we're all facing, and that's the management of landscapes, and, uh, and I will particularly focus on, on woodlands today. Um, I will spend some early time uh, in the presentation to trying to set a stage for the complexity that, that we're facing and uh, um, the solutions that I'm proposing will be rather simple and, and not that expensive. So hopefully many of you will uh, try to implement that in, in your area. So. I will be just starting by, hmm, my computer would work. Let's advance it. Ah, okay. Um, so when we look at a worldwide area, there are some really, really good news uh, in terms of the number or the, uh, <clears throat> the surface area of protected area. Um, there's a big target of 20%, um, and it differs a little bit. Uh, this is a little older figure, but uh, in, in essence, we see an increase in the growth, uh, the acreage of protected areas. Um, uh, the U.S. ranks number one in size, but not necessarily in the proportion of the area protected. Botswana is the leader uh, in that one. Um, and uh, so this sounds really, really good. Um, but uh, we can't squeeze all the earth biota in uh, in small areas or into into the Arctic and uh, and high glacier peaks where a lot of the protected areas are. Um, there are some really interesting conceptual things that people are facing trying to connect big conservation areas. So dream big, the Yellowstone to Yukon uh, region and the corridor may be one of these examples. And you can see this is two thousand miles long many, many miles, hundreds of miles wide, and it would protect a whole variety of different species um, that live in the, uh, in the Rocky Mountain areas. Um, um, and so people trying to connect the places that are already protected. Um, yeah, but the question then is, can all the species that we need to protect go to these protected places? Um, a similar idea, um, that I would consider uh, as a great opportunity would be uh, <clears throat> an eco and eastern conservation opportunity. Uh, given that climate change will be happening, other things are happening to our species, maybe we want to consider the eastern woodlands or even further than that because I know I have individuals from uh, further out west uh, uh, on, the, on the webinar today. Maybe we need to consider what we want to do um, multinational here with the U.S. and Canada in terms of protecting large, large landscapes. Uh, that doesn't mean that we want to throw all the people out, but protection is more than just uh, preventing access of people or reducing the uh, uh, importance of people in the, as destructive forces. But the question that always is, are we or our landscapes ready if we face uh, some mass, mass migration? At a small scale where many of you may work, this could uh, look similar to what we have happening around Ithaca. 
Um, so I assume you can see my cursor um, uh, in, in places. Uh, we're located here, Tompkins County, Ithaca is right there. The yellow dots represent areas that our local land trust uh, has protected through various means. Sometimes they directly own it, sometimes these are cons conservation areas. Um, and the idea is to create something that they have called the Emerald Necklace, which is a, uh, a string of protected areas around Ithaca that would allow species to move freely uh, and the places would be protected. Um, the question though is, what does it mean you have a protected area? Um, very often we understand it's safe from development, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily safe from other threats. So basically what we create with protected areas are virtual fences. Um, and they come in various uh, levels of protection from wilderness area, national parks and monuments to wildlife refuges, parks, preserves, um, and maybe at the, at the lowest ends are conservation easements. Um, <clears throat> and I, I assume they are in, in all the states of individuals that are represented at the, at the webinar. Um, and uh, as I said, there's different levels of protections that there is, but they're not preventing, uh, for example, uh, invasive species or pollution or, or other things from happening or climate change. The performance then, uh, how well do they function is a question of their size, the connectivity, or they connected to larger uh, spots. Can uh, individuals move in among them? What is the species composition? And uh, particular, what are the remaining threats? So simply by uh, calling a, a place protected doesn't necessarily mean that it is performing well. Uh, and we're talking here about the conservation functions. That's the focus of, uh, uh, of this, this webinar. So what I call the great challenge in conservation, and it's inspired what, uh, what Aldo articulated in the land ethic, is understanding and enhancing the capacity for ecosystem self-renewal. Um, and he was uh, either elusive or pretty clear about not uh, creating species composition in various landscapes, but uh, that the ecosystems had some way of forming and abandoning themselves in their various compositions. And I think that's a very useful way to think about that. But what does it mean enhancing the capacity for ecosystem self-renewal or ecosystem health? It requires that we identify the threats that are there and they can, can come at uh, various scales that can either be global, regional, or local. Uh, I will today focus uh, on the, the local efforts and the appropriate actions that we can take locally, but uh, I will at least mention what the global <clears throat> threat landscape looks like. Um, and we have things from climate change, pollution, uh, the increased human footprint associated with our population size, overharvesting in the oceans or uh, uh, in the terrestrial habitats. Uh, very little that you could do as individuals um, about that on a, on a daily basis other than being politically active or uh, changing the ways that uh, you interact with the environment uh, as individuals. And there are regional threats, again, pollution, such as uh, aerial depositions or acid rain, as we have faced here in the Northeast a lot. Habitat loss would be part of that. Uh, biological invasions are, are always local, but always regional as well. And then trophic downgrading, that's basically the elimination of a whole bunch of uh, top predators that then allow herbivores to, uh, uh, to flourish in the absence of their natural enemies. This webinar will focus on the local threats that we have, which is habitat loss, uh, land use, the history uh, or the present day land use, biological invasions, overexploitation, and it can be uh, through harvesting, um, sampling of valuable plant species, insect species, whatever you have, or recreational uh, activities. Uh, those of you that manage uh, parks, preserves, uh, or other landscapes or your own lands uh, will know what that means. It could be fire, it could be pollution, but largely here at the local level would be point source pollution. Um, we don't have an, uh, a possibility to affect the regional pollution other than by shutting down uh, the local polluters. So my guiding principles 
um, that I just wanted to articulate at the beginning. Um, and again, I go back to Aldo who articulated that. I have no hope for conservation born of fear. Um, and uh, I will get into that one a little bit in the next few slides. But I will also focus on individual responsibilities and opportunities. That's where you come in. Um, you're on the webinar because you want to learn something. I would like to give you a few simple things that you can actually do in your neighborhoods, on your properties, uh, or as decision makers. I want to build that local capacity and the empowerment through active participation. Uh, but I want to funnel the participation into a certain direction. Um, and that's how we develop conservation ownership and pride. Um, I'm not going to go into the public trust doctrine or pub public trust thinking today, um, but that should guide the way that we're dealing with our, uh, with our environment, our natural resources. Um, yeah, those of you that want to learn more about that, I can send you guys a paper that I've done with our hair, one of my former graduate students on that. So a good example of uh, uh, fear and what, uh, what we hear on a daily basis, one way or the other, is climate change and we're really doomed. Um, so this, when you go on the web and you try to find images of climate change, you get the disasters, however they are, whether they're hurricanes or fire, or you can get these concocted pictures of a polar bear with penguins, uh, and I don't know what kind of seal it is on there. That doesn't even exist, uh, because penguins and polar bears do not cross their paths other than in the zoo. Uh, but that's what we're supposed to believe, that's what we're supposed to act on, um, I'm not denying that there is climate change, so don't get me wrong. But on the other hand, uh, if we follow this, we should just go sit in the bar and drink beer uh, until this is happening to us. I just got to note that my internet is stable, so hopefully, uh, unstable, hopefully that is all not inter interfering with what I'm trying to do. So I don't buy into this one. Nobody should buy into this one, at least not in terms of just sticking your head in the sand. Uh, and not wanting to do anything because we're doomed. Um, and then in the long run, most of the organisms, not as individuals, but as species, have been going through changes in CO2, in temperature, in glaciation, or whatever, and they have survived these. Um, uh, there is no balance of nature other than a constant up and down. The balance of nature is something that um, maybe uh, Terminators want to use uh, when they remove uh, species that are not wanted in the houses, and people can write books about that and debunk it. As uh, Stuart Pickett many years ago said, it makes nice poetry, but it's not such great science. So what we're facing is a constant up and down and changing in the, uh, in the environment uh, and conditions that we face. Species have faced that all the time. Again, I'm not denying that that is happening or accelerating, uh, but it's not something that is uh, unheard of. What is, what is happening, though, is that we always think nature is so weak and it will succumb. But there are natural disasters and human-made disasters, like in the top line, Chernobyl. At the bottom is Mount St. Helens. Um, ecological disasters happen at a regular frequency, although they are unpredictable, and nature comes back. It's very resilient in terms of the species and ecosystems. Uh, Chernobyl and what has recovered there is now a paradise for species. Individuals still have deformities uh, and they may have lower lifespans than uh, uh, individuals that are not living around Chernobyl, but it's a paradise for moose and wolves and uh, all kinds of other critters that uh, reoccupy the spaces that the humans have left. Um, and uh, only few people can visit. The same happened uh, at Mount St. Helens that uh, landscapes recover after ecological disasters. Um, that's nothing that is happening recent, um, as it happened all the time through human history, whether these were uh, people going in, cutting down the rainforest, and leaving it for whatever reasons, and the rainforest comes back. Uh, we have touched all kinds of places. Nuclear wars or the Bikini Atoll now is a paradise for divers to come in. Uh, you can't take anything there because it's still uh, radioactive, but you can go and dive in the shipwrecks or uh, experience the underwater uh, fascination. So nature is extremely resilient. It comes back, the conditions are different, 
the species composition may be different, but we don't necessarily have extinction happening at the same time. So nature is not weak. It will come back. Maybe the places are unsuitable for us to live, um, but a lot of species are able to deal with that. So how does that happen? Um, it happens through a number of different processes. Uh, and I'm going to highlight a couple. One is phenotypic plasticity. So basically that means that you can tolerate all kinds of conditions. Stay in place and tolerate. And those is, that's done by individuals, not by species or populations. We have individuals, particularly plants, uh, and I focus a lot on plants today, that are extremely old, have stood in place because they can't move, and have gone through ice ages. The oldest tree we think now is 9,500 years old in Sweden. Uh, it's this little, little scraggly thing here um, on some kind of a, looks like a, a tundra environment with lots of mosses. We heard about the bristlecone um, pines. The oldest is over 5,000 years old. And then the giant sequoias, uh, they're not the oldest as individuals, but we have a whole bunch of individuals that are over 1,000 years old. So things have shifted over 5,000 or 9,000 years. There are species, not necessarily individuals like Norway spruce, as has stayed in place in Sweden through the ice ages. Um, so that means that they have the ability to tolerate all kinds of conditions um, that uh, uh, nature throws at them. And the plasticity is also something that can mean stay in place and evolve. And I'm showcasing here uh, two clonal species. One on the left is a grass native Phragmites australis americanus, so not the invasive variety, but it's clonal. Nobody knows how long individuals can live. Individual tissues may not live for very long times, but uh, an individual clone may be 50 years old, 100, maybe 1,000 years. We have no idea because the tissues decay. The same for um, our, our aspens in the Rocky Mountains. They're clonal. Here's a clone depicted in its uh, beautiful fall color. Um, the individual stems that rise up above ground uh, may live for a few decades. The individual, we have no idea how old they are. Um, so will the individual stems and trees that come out be different? Have they evolved from the ones that were there uh, a few hundred or a few thousand years ago? We, we do not know. But people are adapting to uh, species like invasive species that we have right now. These are the two trees on the right. They're not clonal, clearly not, but hemlock and ash are two species that are under severe threat by introduced species, uh, both insects. Both of them have shown, very few individuals at them have shown a resistance to hemlock woolly adelgid and ash. Uh, there are various ways of how resistance can work. Um, and in typical fashion, uh, very few individuals of the total population are showing that resistance. It's the same with insects. Once we find a new uh, pesticide, the vast majority of a particular species that we spray will be not resistant and they will succumb to a pesticide, but a few individuals will show up and show resistance. So we have hemlock and ash that are resistant. Very few of the individuals that are out there are doing that, but we will not... Um, 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 lose them in terms of extinction. Um, they may look different, they will act differently, but uh, there is hope for evolution to come to the rescue with those. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do biocontrol for the species that I just talked about. The last thing that uh, individuals, not individuals, but populations or species can do is move by tracking their climate envelope and um, probably evolve to the new local conditions. What's depicted here is the range expansion of uh, white oak in Europe after the last glaciation. So this gets to questions of, is that an invasion? Is it a range expansion? What's the native area that white, ho white oak has occupied? Um, and so uh, I'm not gonna go into any of these details and the philosoph uh, philosophical aspects of that, but clearly there were ice age refugia that the species occupied, and after the ice, uh, the ice disappeared, the species moved in lots of different directions, north, east, uh, west, and has reoccupied most of Europe as it went through that. So here, uh, if you don't have extensions, you have refugia where organisms can hang out, 
you have the ability to go and recolonize areas once it becomes uh, suitable for them to live there. This is happening right now to large European carnivores. I came to the US in 1992 because I said, hey, there's lots of space, there's lots of big predators. Um, I like to uh, experience that. Uh, while the wolves in the 70s and 80s were hanging out somewhere in the east, there were some remnant populations in the Pyrenees and uh, in Italy. And right now, the wolves are back all over Europe. Uh, coming from the refugia, and the same happens for brown bear, uh, the lynx, and the wolverine. So here in the middle, uh, well, I ignore the middle, but on the right, you can kind of see that uh, wolves have expanded from the refugia that were there, and I believe this is from 2015 or something like that. But we have wolves now showing up in Denmark, uh, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, um, there are lots of uh, populations in France, uh, largely in the mountains uh, and in the central massif. Uh, but where I grew up, somewhere over here, we now have wolf packs in the area where I grew up. Um, and uh, the Europeans allow the recolonization of these big predators. I wish that would be happening in the U.S. as well. So here's recolonization from refu refugia. doesn't matter whether you are vertebrates or... Um, um, turtles or uh, invertebrates or plants. The question then is what are essential features for success to allow that? The primary thing is that we need to prevent extinctions. Once species are extinct, there's no coming back. I don't buy into uh, the genetic rescue from fossilized uh, eggs or <laughs> something like that. I think conservation dollars are wasted on that. But then, if we still have organisms uh, that are available, individuals, they need to have the ability to survive and particularly reproduce. Uh, for many plants, we need pollinators. For those that are not wind pollinators, um, others we need uh, dispersal vectors. Large populations are really beneficial because it allows high genetic variation to create new combinations. If there are new uh, uh, climate conditions that uh, are there, or if they move through landscapes and need to be able to adapt to the local conditions. And with large populations, you have large genetic var uh, variability, and that is helpful. Uh, you prevent inbreeding depression. We've seen that with a lot of isolated populations, and they don't have genetic exchange or very low uh, in terms of the number of individuals. Sometimes spring in, in uh, individuals to the rescue like what has happened with snakes in Illinois or with the uh, um, Florida panther, uh, you can rescue these populations by just bringing in a few new genes. Um, we then need to connect the suitable landscape or dispersal vector or have dispersal vectors uh, if there's a stepping stone fashion that these organisms need to come in. So um, these are the essential feature features, really. Um, um, and if we go a little closer to home now, uh, from the big picture and the particulars. Um, this is the New York landscape. Um, and uh, very similar landscapes are in, in the Northeast. I know there are some uh, places that had more forest or less forest, um, but uh, much of the, the Eastern forest was cut down, made into dairy industry or other agricultural uses, and then uh, uh, after land abandonment and westward movement of a lot of the people, uh, the forests return. So we have very young forests over much of the, of the Northeast. Surprisingly, though, we had very few extinctions. Um, we had uh, uh, certainly the passenger pigeon and the Carolina parakeet that are no longer with us. So they are done. You can look at museum specimens. Um, it's not that long, long ago that we lost them. But uh, I believe they're... If there are any plant extinctions, I do know about them. That may be my mistake. But I know about the fauna in, um, uh, I'm sorry, about the flora in, in New York, um, and particularly in Tompkins County, we basically have lost almost no species. Their abundances have shifted. Um, and uh, some of them may only occur in isolated populations somewhere. But we had functional extinctions um, and, um, that clearly is with the big predators like wolves and mountain lions or the American chestnut, uh, which maybe see a, a return to 
to some of its form of beauty with some of the uh, breeding experiments that we have going on and uh, the efforts of the American Chestnut Foundation. But they are not really uh, functioning in the way that previous landscapes uh, would have functioned that were forested. So few, ex few extinctions, uh, which offers a lot of hope for the ability to organisms to tolerate that. Also remember that these forests return and are thriving and the species are there while we have uh, habitat destruction, acid rain, climate change, all kinds of other forces that are there that do not have driven these species to extinction. So we have something to work with. It's there. It doesn't mean that there will be no future extinctions, but we have these species still with us. So what I call here is a we have magnificent species and recovering landscapes. Sometimes they occur in surprising places, like Central Park, um, totally human-made and human-surrounded landscapes. Um, but places like cities are some of the, the conservation frontiers. Over 90% of the northeastern bee species that uh, would be expected to exist anywhere exist in New York City. Um, there's data from Europe and other places uh, that show cities as the uh, last holdouts for some of the, the biodiversity that can't function in, in, in largely agricultural areas. Uh, I'll show you a picture in a moment. So sometimes we need to look in places that we don't think about, um, and organisms can make a, make a living in there. Doesn't mean that uh, we should squeeze all the species into, into a central park. There are other issues with that as well. We have those places there, we just need to need to find them uh, and protect them. One of the things that uh, I will go quite a bit into is what we call trophic downgrading. That happens in the oceans, that happens in different landscapes around the world, and basically uh, very often it's the elimination of uh, structural forces like top predators uh, or diseases that were wiped out, and then you have ecosystems fundamental ecosystem change. I'm not gonna go into a lot of the details. We'll focus on the lowest end, the New York or US forest, where elimination of top predators have, uh, has, in, has increased the abundance of, uh, um, of lovely herbivores. Um, and this is what these herbivores are doing. Oops, I'm sorry. Watch this one down here. That's a trillium. That was a trillium, at least the flower and the structure is gone. But this is one of the important sorting factors um, in forests in the US. Once this occurs as uh, single individuals, um, that's okay. Once we have larger populations, we get into, uh, we may get into all kinds of trouble. Um, but here we have a big herbivore deer. And I think that may be the only picture of deer that I show the structures of our landscapes. Uh, those that are remaining, um, that are not transformed, like this agricultural field in, uh, uh, in Illinois. So as far as the eye can see, a couple of individual trees, this is in, in mid-May. Uh, I was visiting Don Waller and the, the University of Wisconsin. We were looking at some uh, protected uh, areas in, uh, in Wisconsin, in, in Illinois, and we drove through part of Illinois, and uh, this is what you see. Um, it's pretty clear that you can't grow trilliums or orchids or any other things um, that are of conservation interest, <coughs> excuse me, in these landscapes. Uh, it's kind of amazing to see the transformations uh, that are there. Uh, when places may have looked like the pictures to the left and to the right. Um, so they're there. Uh, they're in the Midwest. Uh, here's Don Waller examining uh, some of the last holdouts of Canada U growing on a bluff. Uh, right here where the deer can't get to them anymore. Uh, I believe that's the Mississippi River in the background. Bluebells, uh, we have uh, beautiful places like that. But those of you that know how to look at a forest see that there is very little in the understory. Uh, here over to the right, uh, we have lovely spring wildflowers. Uh, but each of those flags that I put in here is actually a, uh, uh, a deer grouse. Uh, and I believe on the upper, upper right-hand corner, um, and, um, these, are, these are all trilliums. And the lower one, we still have a clump 
um, of uh, <laughs> wonderful native wildflowers with one flower left, the other six or seven have been browsed. So in those places, while they're under protection, we have deer impacts, structure, uh, the size, and also the communities that are there. So the stories that I'm gonna tell today further, other than this big, this big overview, um, have developed over the last a little more than a decade based on deer exclosures and other experiments that we have done uh, with funding from various uh, places, the uh, Department of Defense, Cornell University and others uh, in various places in New York. Uh, we have done experiments with different size exclosures and um, uh, I've talked about that uh, before. Um, I uh, have the ability to play on our own uh, woodlot and, and farm here uh, at home where I can play with, uh, with areas. That's that area is called Bobbling Hill. Uh, and we've experimented with various sizes of exclosures. So a lot of the things that I'm talking about are informed by some of these experiments. So I'm coming to some very, very simple recommendations for you. I'm gonna go through some of the details and hopefully we have some time to discuss some of that. My first recommended action for you, and many of you may have done this already, locate appropriate places with thriving populations of native plants or species and know where they are. Most of you will know that already in the places that you are. Um, larger populations are better than smaller ones. Larger areas are better than smaller ones. But there's a caveat. Just because it is protected does not mean it qualify for uh, you to put high on a priority list you want to be active. The page or the picture in the middle here is the biodiversity preserve at the University of Binghamton. Um, it's kind of given away that deer have structured the forest in a way that there's nothing in the understory. And you see a clear browse line. Um, so this place probably doesn't qualify, at least not at the present time, because you have no valuable assets left. The place on the right is one of the fences that we have installed at West Point for experiments. Uh, again, there's not much inside or outside because that's just immediately after the installation. But this place may also not qualify because we now know from long-term experiments that communities do not recover very quickly. So it's really important for you to know where your assets are, where your valuable populations are. Uh, and then you go to uh, local action number two. Um, you want a fence. Fence as large of an area as possible. Fencing individuals uh, is not a good it's not a good investment um, unless you only have a couple of individuals left. But you need to have areas where seeds can fall, where things can recruit, uh, where other organisms can live. So fence as large of an area or areas as possible with the resources that you have available. Uh, you may wanna help some species along if they do not exist in, the, in those fenced areas or even transport some species there. Uh, uh, if you have only a few individuals uh, where it's not worth fencing. Um, those are decisions that you can make at the, at the local level. Um, and we all know if the species that are existing uh, or still existing in areas that you fence, they will respond to that. Um, as you can clearly see at the two um, pictures on the, in the center and on the left. Uh, organisms will respond to, to the protection that they are receiving. Um, and the last thing that you want to do then, that's not the last thing, but action number three is uh, restore. Um, that means plant seeds, seedling plants, there seems to be more success um, with uh, using larger seedlings or even plants if you can uh, tend them along. Uh, you can assess and improve the areas where, uh, where they're growing, uh, particularly through managing some invaders. Uh, or vegetation if that becomes necessary. Um, uh, but that should be like uh, uh, rather the, uh, the last resort to interfere there um, only if it's absolutely necessary. So these are very simple things that I have to say. You have all heard about that before. Uh, and we can talk about what the, and I will talk about it, what the benefits are and why I think fencing will do the trick. 
for most species, not for all of them. The challenges that we're facing with all of these um, and why I'm recommending the local action is the life history of the organisms that we're dealing with. There's no seed bank for most of the species. Uh, and I'm talking largely about plants again and, and then the herbaceous ones. But the same would go for most of the tree species. No long-lived seed bank, very different from, uh, from wetland areas. There's also no quick community turnover. So we thought that if we fence areas that uh, species composition would shift very quickly. If deer have been in, in high abundance over, over many, many years uh, or decades, they have sorted the community to those uh, individuals and species can live with high deer abundance. Uh, and putting a fence around it and saying, oh, there's no difference inside and out, doesn't mean that the deer didn't have a sorting effect, uh, but the recovery uh, of communities or the turnover of communities extremely slow. Um, it, will not, it will not work quickly. Um, lots of patience required. And then there is the slow life history uh, of most of the species that we're dealing with. Um, those of you that have tried to work with native species uh, in the woodlands, many have very specific germination requirements. Let me take them uh, uh, one or two uh, uh, different cold stratification periods, depending on the species. They have very long juvenile periods, uh, trillium, seven years before they can, before they can flower sometimes. They have very low fecundity, low dispersal ability, and that all makes it really, really difficult uh, to recover areas uh, to um, a nice mixed woodland vegetation if you don't have seed sources next by uh, that can help repopulate that. One of the things with the slow life history, maybe they have high phenotypic plasticity. That's why they're still around. Uh, some of the trilliums and some of the other ones that I'm going to be talking about can basically go back from being mature individuals to almost looking like juveniles, uh, one leaf trilliums after you have flowered or so. Uh, so maybe there's high phenotypic plasticity, long adult lives. Uh, so we have marked trilliums and I've followed individuals for well over a decade, and we know that from some of the orchids that we have done. Uh, we don't lose them. Uh, so that's a great benefit as well. Uh, but once they are lost as individuals or as populations, it's really, really hard to get them back. Uh, and then we have these uh, isolated populations where we may have low genetic diversity uh, that will hamper our um, uh, restoration and recovery and conservation efforts. The good news, though, even though these graphs may not look like uh, great news, is that almost all the species can exist in the in the woodlands that we have. So here are 20. I believe these are 20 species of native uh, uh, woodlands from grasses to ferns to, to trilliums. And that's Annis's Dobson's uh, uh, PhD that I'm just showing here. We're just preparing the publications for that. We had her plant seedlings in fenced and open areas with and without earthworms. Um, and <clears throat> you can basically see there's a lot of mortality. Um, so at the bottom you have the number of years. So these are uh, five years of observations. Um, the decline and, or the survival of juveniles is not very high. They decline, but a lot of them hang in there. Uh, they can survive in earthworm and non-earthworm populations or in earthworm and vein areas. That's slightly different than what I may have uh, talked about uh, a few years ago, where we initially just looked at survival of seedlings uh, within the first year. And earthworms were devastating to, uh, uh, to native seedlings for almost all of them, with very few exceptions. Uh, we are refining that message a little bit. A lot of species, at least when you plant them out, these were planted as little, uh, little seedlings. Um, they, uh, they can tolerate those conditions that the earthworms are creating. Uh, they can tolerate even uh, the presence of deer. There's, however, a caveat in this one, if you just look through that. Uh, fenced and open areas are uh, very often the same in terms of, of the survival. And the deer, uh, I'm sorry, earthworms and non-earthworm survival is very, very similar as well. But most of these species grow so slow that they haven't reached what Don Waller calls the molar zone. So they're below very often 15 centimeters or so, or a foot, where deer wouldn't go down and browse them. Um, 
but we are suffering from very low survival as juveniles. Whether that's driven by uh, the landscape changes, previous land use history, or um, or deposition and changes in, in soil fertility or so, we do not understand. But basically, um, we know that most of the organisms that we still have around, we, we didn't test very rare ones here, they can live in the forests of the Northeast as there are surrounding Ithaca just fine, but very slow, very low recruitment. If you protect them from deer by behind fences, the recovery <coughs> of, uh, uh, of mature individuals is also really, really slow. It can take many, many, many years. Um, but if you do not fence them, you will lose your populations over time. Even very uh, large populations will disappear. Uh, and you can kind of see that by the differences between, this is the height uh, for white and red trilliums, uh, as I have it here. I indicate some heel storm and recovery after that. But the ones in the, um, uh, in the fenced, uh, areas maintain their height while the ones in the open are declining. That has consequences for their, for their fecundity, um, but over time they are diverging more and more and more. Um, and uh, um, as I said, over time that decline in height and also in fecundity will basically doom these populations. Um, this is the population of plants browsed uh, in for white and red trillium. Um, we, and they are from the same area. Um, the browse intensity differs between closely related plants in the same area in the same years. Sometimes whites are uh, preferred to browse, sometimes the reds are, uh, uh, are a higher proportion of them is browsed. Well, we know some, from some previous work from Tiffany Knight and others that if more than 15% uh, of the flowering plants will be browsed, that results ultimately in a population decline. Um, and the 15% line is indicated here. So for red trilliums, unless they are fenced uh, and the browse is very, very low, every single year exceeded 15%. So we will lose those populations. For white trilliums, the message is not much better because then most of the years that we have monitored, um, the browse intensity is so high that even huge populations would decline over time. The protection from browse will increase the height and increase reproduction. And that's what depicted here is depicted here. Again, white and red trilliums. What we're ultimately interested in is that the populations remain in places and they expand. For the trilliums, that depends on seed production. Um, and we can kind of know that or kind of see that in uh, the areas that are fenced. Most of the individuals are actually flowering in each year. Um, not necessarily for all the white trilliums, but uh, the proportion of flowering individuals in unfenced areas is clearly uh, greatly reduced. That's not only in terms of the proportion of individuals flowering, but also in terms of the number of seeds. You can see this here for uh, red trilliums. I have the white trillium. I didn't put the white trillium numbers up here, but you can see we're open and deer have access. The number of seeds produced is uh, in, the, in the teens, uh, sometimes in, in, in places, uh, it's much less than that. So these are the seeds of plants that are flowered and we're actually producing a fruit. Uh, it's much, much larger and increasing for the plants, uh, the individuals that are protected. So their seed output increases and uh, we're getting individuals that produce many more than 100 seeds in, uh, uh, in a single, uh, in a single uh, seed head. Um, we had some ecological surprises that were there. Um, again, that may relate to some phenotypic plasticity. Um, we didn't know that trilliums could go dormant uh, for one year and not show up as a, as a green plant. Uh, and it's influenced by fencing. So um, in fenced areas, very few of the individuals go, go dormant. This is over like an eight year uh, time period on the left. And it differs from year to year. So we have individuals in the open that are exposed to deer herbivory uh, that go dormant and may not show up. Uh, what that ultimately does to their longevity, we have no idea, but there are ecological surprises. So we have, uh, they don't grow as well if they're exposed to deer. They don't make as many seeds as uh, 
when they are exposed to deer. So the, their contribution to population growth is, uh, is, is minimal or, uh, or non-existent. And that's for the trilliums we know. It's not for all trilliums. Uh, it seems that the painted trilliums seem to do an okay, even with uh, reasonably, high, uh, reasonably high deer browse because they're not being browsed until later in the year when they basically have done all their reproduction and, uh, uh, and photosynthesis for the year. It's not only happening for, uh, for trilliums, it happens for myanthemum, uh, Solomon as well. Um, so uh, has joey flower spikes, lovely fruits. Uh, and here's just some data that I collected here from, uh, from our hillside. Uh, where we had areas under protection uh, for seven years. That's a similar area. Uh, and there's recovery if these individuals are existing. So these are not planted out ones. These are basically two, three leaves, sometimes one leaf uh, plants that recovered. If you protect them, all of a sudden you have a large number of them that are actually flowering uh, compared to unprotected ones. Uh, the average number of seed per plant is still very, very low. Uh, 24 seeds for, for an individual. There are obviously some that can produce well over 100, uh, but these are the large, large individuals that are uh, uh, that may be very old. 10 if they're unprotected. But here is the astounding thing. Well, the difference between the average number of seeds uh, may not be that large. Uh, it's double, but um, still uh, pretty low with 24. The total number of seeds that were produced in the protected area is well over 1,000, but well, it's only 70. Uh, in, uh, in the unprotected ones, so where deer had access to them. Um, you can kind of imagine what that does. We haven't done the demog demography on these, uh, on these individuals uh, and on, on the species, but if you're interested in maintaining populations, you need a lot of seed. Again, uh, like most of the other ones, these cannot uh, um, uh, reproduce uh, vegetatively, so what they can hang there. So what's the benefit of the simple thing that I'm telling you? Go out and fence. Uh, you can protect and increase your assets. Uh, whatever you value, that may differ depending on where you are. Uh, and it may not, uh, uh, it probably doesn't uh, extend to salamanders and birds. All the birds and salamanders may benefit from some of the, uh, the things that you create by fencing out there. Um, but it all starts with the primary producers here for me, the plants. You protect the species and the seed sources for the future because you will need them. If you lose them, there's nothing that you have, even if we reverse climate change, if you reverse all the pollution, if we don't have habitat fragmented anymore, we have uh, uh, woodlands grow back. If you don't have the species and the seed sources, you're doomed. Uh, well, you are not doomed, but you're not going to get the benefits of the, the nice diversity that we're looking for. And I believe that by doing what I'm telling you and be active in promoting the native species, you're increasing manager and volunteer or citizen satisfaction. Um, it's a great thing to see these species uh, return or grow and flower. Um, it's very different than having a whole bunch of folks go out um, and uh, pull up invasive species and put them in a, in a garbage bag and into the landfill, uh, and then not much is happening afterwards. You enable evolution. Uh, that can be underestimated here. If you have large species, uh, pools, large numbers of organisms in there, um, there is something that evolution can do with that. Like, uh, whatever that may mean, uh, different threats will require different ways how evolution can deal with that. Um, and uh, it's happening actually reasonably fast. It doesn't take geological time scales. I believe by doing something as positive as we are talking about, we actually improve recruitment messaging and we will get future conservationists uh, uh, that or maybe little kids right now uh, who would want to engage when everything is doomed anyway. Uh, so here are things that uh, I believe will help us recruit new generations of folks that can take over once we are done. Uh, you can create demonstration projects to actually showcase um, that you're making a difference by doing this. That has political implications, that has funding implications, that again has messaging implications the way that I see it. There's lots of opportunities for learning and assessments. I'm going to show you a little bit of that. <coughs> what I'm knowing today with having done these um, exposure projects and some planting projects, I had no idea about um, 15 years ago. 
um, it's fascinating for me. I hope it's fascinating for some other people uh, to learn about the life history of a trillium or life history of a myanthemum or uh, any other organisms that you have an affinity for. Um, there were lots of ecological surprises. We can control invasive species by simply fencing out deer. Garlic mustard declines, microstegium, Japanese stiltgrass declines. You don't need to do anything other than fencing out the deer and the native species will come back too if they're still there. Uh, one of the big things um, is learning to be patient. None of these things are fast. Um, um, conservation uh, thought has to happen on the order of decades or centuries. That's why it's important to do fencing now to be ready for whatever challenges are being thrown at you and at the species over time uh, and seeing the recovery happen uh, over time. Uh, learning to be patient is not something that's easy these days or everything is, uh, is happening fast, but it's an important trait to have. Um, so here are the things that uh, some of the species that I've, that I've worked with, and I wanted to showcase something about, uh, this is a dem demographic model. Um, and I talked about slow life history and phenotypic plasticity a lot. This is what trilliums can do. Here are three different species that actually act differently. But they go from seed to a cotyledon, the cotyledon may be out there a few years, to one leaf, to a small three leaf, to a large three leaf, to a flowering leaf. And you can see that they can actually, depending on how the, uh, the conditions are, they can reverse back almost all, they can go all the way back to a one leaf. So a lot of herbivory may create a flower or drive a flowering trillium back to a one leaf. And you have no idea that this individual may be 10, 20, 30 years old. We don't think it can regress to a cotyledon, but it, will, it may stay here for a while. That's one of the survival strategies of a very long-lived but slow-living species. Uh, we see the same for myanthamon, where you can have individuals that are surviving just by showing a single leaf and not growing up to uh, three feet tall as they, as they potentially could. So over time, with doing what I have done here with fencing, and we throw experiments at that, but I had the ability to then see things return uh, and flourish and recruit as I was putting fences out and putting number tags on individuals. Not everybody needs to do that, um, but there are opportunities for learning uh, uh, all along. So I can now go through my woodlands here and I can see flowering trilliums behind fences being much bigger than some flowering trilliums uh, outside if, if I have them. Uh, I can look at the difference between, uh, between the orchids and the trilliums um, and the different trillium species. And so for me, being able to do that increases my satisfaction with my existence here on, uh, on our hill much more so than um, when I would go out and uh, 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 do garlic mustard control, which I have done here too for many, many years um, uh, and, uh, um, and stopped doing that and was much more successful in that way. Um, one of the things that we were learning uh, was that as you are uh, taking deer out, you are controlling earthworm populations. Why? We don't know. I've presented that before. I just wanted to showcase that again uh, here. Uh, that has all kinds of other ecological benefits for, for increasing litter and uh, the organisms that live, uh, live in the litter. Uh, as I said before, we can reduce the growth rates and abundance of different, uh, uh, different invasive species. So my recommendations for you, spend your dollar and energy wisely. Uh, and I can not make it more simple, maybe I could make it more simple than this, but I would say do this a lot. Spend a lot of your resources on fencing, have your volunteers do that. Doesn't need to be as pretty as this one, this was professionally installed. We now use uh, eyeballs and others um, in uh, uh, using trees for that non-valuable commercial trees, Peter, in case you're uh, worrying about that, uh, we can find that. Uh, I, and I can talk more about that at maybe a future time. Maybe do this um, in the middle, just reduce the deer abundance. But that's also a political heavy lifting that needs to do regulated hunting, recreational hunting, the way that it's being implemented and regulated right now does help very, very little. Uh, it slows down the erosion process but it helps maybe feed your family. Um, so you can do a little bit of that. Uh, but do very little or none of this. So this is the garlic mustard challenge that will be uh, implemented 
probably in a lot of places this year again, where people are proud about the bags of uh, garlic mustard that they take out of the woods, but it doesn't help restore the native species that we care about. Um, and it goes away by itself, which I have talked about in, uh, in different venues before. So in the end, <coughs> we will get to this. Um, I started out with something similar like that. Uh, that's our land ethic. That's my land ethic. It's not very well defined what health is, but here, by at least initially fencing and then allowing species to expand and maybe affecting policy in terms of the overarching regional and global stressors that are affecting the local woodlands, we will be able to sit in the sun, watch the birds, watch the plants grow, and have a better time with it than if we go out uh, and do all kinds of uh, uh, other exercises that may be not as successful in the long run. Thank you very much. Very well done, Baron. Thank you. That's uh, a very, as you started off by saying, it's a very complex issue and you captured that well. And then you gave some very practical hands-on uh, things to do so you can take people from a, a hand-wringing state of mind to a dirt under the fingernails state of mind. So <laughs> that was good. Um, and there are already several questions and this is the opportunity for you all when you, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in. I'm going to uh, read the questions to Baron, and I'm going to scroll back to where we started. All right. So there's one, uh, there's a post and link um, talking about virtual fences. Are you familiar with virtual fences, Aaron? <laughs> virtual fences is just in your imagination. Basically, that's what we do around protected areas. Is that a question what a virtual fence is? Uh, well, so it says there's a link uh, to a publication that's titled Good Virtual Fences Make Good Neighbors, Opportunities for Conservation. Oh. <laughs> I will, I will. Um, Let I'll, me see what I, I can get. I will, I'll, I'll send that, you. I'll send you the link later. Okay. So that, okay. So, all right. And... So Marguerite says, with limited resources, either dollars or time, what is an ethical decision framework for choosing which species to focus your recovery efforts? Yeah, that's a, so so in I, a, had, so it's I like, had a slide in here where I wanted to go and say, well, how do you make decisions? Uh, I believe that I cannot capture that for more than a very local uh, area and it is fraught with difficulties that are both philosophical, monetary, um, uh, and there is no good decision-making framework at the present time. So the way that I like to think about it is I want to give species an opportunity to basically duke it out and what I mean by duke it out is allow them to exist, allow them to have flourishing populations, and they need to then sort out uh, their relative abundance over time. Uh, fences will do some of it, right? Uh, that allow the existence, allow them to grow, allow them to reproduce, and then whoever uh, uh, can work best under certain circumstances um, should do well there. Now, that doesn't take into account the species that will need to migrate into areas that may be not existing in your, in your neighborhood. Uh, you probably want to focus on some of the rarest uh, if your conditions are still okay to protect them and enhance them. Uh, there, there is no good way of making those decisions. Um, and beauty will be in the eye of the beholder. There will be some people saying we should focus on grasses or sedges or trilliums or any other species. Um, there, there's, there's no good way um, that would take your biases, however they are coming into it, out. Um, I don't know of one, um, and I don't think there is a good one. This is existing more than at the, at the local level. Okay. Eli wants to... Let me to add something to that, Peter. Sure. Uh, if you have populations 
uh, that are thriving, even if these are common species. White trilliums and red trilliums are still common species, right? Uh, but we will lose them if we don't do anything. Fence those species. Um, and so don't try to find, uh, you know, a 10 by 10 uh, yard, yard or meter area of the rarest of the rarest and saying, I'm doing this and then I'm done. No, fence the still abundant but vulnerable populations. That's doing a lot because by fencing the plants, you also enhance some of the other organisms that, that are threatened indirectly by deer. Okay, Eli wants to know if there would be a time that private unprotected forests would take priority over conservation land. Um, was, this was in this was at about twelve thirty, and it was about when you were talking. I think just starting into some of the local actions, um, and so. So there's a. I have a tiered response to that. Okay. Uh, for me, there is no priority in terms of whether it's private forest versus, um, um, and the interest in doing. Uh, a commercial timber growing versus private lands that want to do conservation. Um, so in either way, I don't necessarily think that there is access to public resources, um, at least not for most conservation. On, um, I may get in hot water here. So let me, let me try to re rephrase that. If you have an area set aside for conservation versus private forestry, um, the pots of money that should be available for that will likely be different. Um, and I don't see a trade-off where private forestry interests should then tap into conservation dollars that are earmarked for conservation. Um, I'm not sure that I'm getting to the, to the point of the of the questioner uh, or of the question directly. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see the trade-off. I don't wanna see conservation dollars be spent on private forestry operation unless the private forestry operation can also show the conservation benefits. So there, there's a question on how you do it. Okay, here's a question about so I'll just I'll read it. it says it sounds like the key uh, to preserve is to preserve biodiversity and reduce monocultures so as to protect species from extinction. So is that a connection there? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure that that is correct because we just had a discussion in our lab group of whether we should actually protect near monocultures of native species. I showed some, uh, what I would call trillium meadows in the woods, right? I would fence that in a heartbeat and I have done so here on our own property. Um, that's a near monoculture. Maybe that's a place where uh, the trilliums really like to be, uh, the white trilliums in this, in this case. Um, um, so, Monocultures of native species in some places are highly appropriate. Salt marshes come to mind. We're talking about woodlands here, um, but you can have tree species that are, can, be, can be near monocultures because it's optimal habitat for, uh, for certain tree species, right? So just because the diversity is low of a primary producer doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't protect it. Okay. Chip says, uh, deer are recognized as a pest species in much of the East in both developed and rural areas. And the populations, deer populations are at levels that affect forest regeneration and composition. Why should we not encourage native predators such as coyotes, bobcats, bear, and others? Oh, I never said that. <laughs> so what I would actually add to that I would want to get rid of hunting and trapping seasons on them um, because uh, bobcats, bears, particularly bears, will contribute to um, uh, reductions in, in deer abundance. However, we know from a bunch of modeling and other exercises is that while the predators kill individual deer, they do not have a population level effect because the deer abundance is so high 
that they cannot suppress them. Um, so I'm happy to, I would love to sit here at home where I'm right now looking out on my window and I would love to see mountain lions and wolf packs just roam the neighborhood. Um, I don't have little kids, so I'm fine with that. Um, and many other people may not be. Um, I would welcome that. But uh, initially, I think it's the responsibility of those regulating hunting uh, to come up with rules and regulations that allow us as humans to suppress the deer populations. And then maybe predators can help. Um, if people that, uh, um, that see coyotes or we had wolves that colonized, there were wolves shot in the Adirondacks and in Kentucky, if people would not be so trigger happy uh, and among the hunters or others, uh, wolves and mountain lions would come back to the east because there's plenty of deer to eat. Um, that's a societal response. I welcome all the predators that we can get. The next question is uh, whether, if, if you can describe the special ecosystem function that Trillium has uh, that makes it an important species for conservation. Uh, uh, I don't know what it has a specific ecosystem function other than being pretty. That's an ecosystem function if it makes people happy. Uh, some people may want to look at, uh, I don't know, an orchid. I'm looking at an orchid and makes me makes me happy most of the time except for some weird ones that are, are maybe not showy, it still makes me happy. Um, um, trilliums and uh, some of the other species that we focused on were just some that were known to start declining and being under particular pressure of high deer population. So that was the choice of the organism to work with. Um, obviously we have, uh, Anis has worked with 20 different species, including some ferns and grasses, and we have done others. When we did our community analysis, there was no specific ecosystem function uh, that Trillium had that came to mind as the choice of topic of interest. Okay. Jessica wants to know if you can provide a recommendation for a protocol for restoration planting in terms of number of plants per plot, size of the plots, whether or not um, it differed depending upon the species and whether you mixed species within communities. So those recommendations I cannot provide because it will differ depending on what you have. I have some general guidelines um, and we know that success of establishment increases as you go from seed to a small seedling, to a larger seedling, to a full plant, at least for herbaceous ones. So, um, we, and I showed the graph of survival, even of small seedlings that we planted, it's very, very low. It's better than from seed. Um, and, but if you have access to, or you can, generate larger individuals and then plant them out in protection, that will do much better. Um, so there is, uh, is a trade-off with how much TLC you have to expand, how much money you have to expand. Um, I would um, try to have, if you plant individuals out that need cross-pollination, you should put clumps of individuals out. Um, never have fewer than 20 individuals. Uh, ideally from different parents that you want to plant out. That's not always possible because sometimes you may not have 20 individuals uh, um, from, uh, from a population. So why do I say 20? Because geneticists have very often determined that once you have 20 individuals um, that are different, you capture a lot of the genetic variation in the population or uh, not necessarily in the species, but in the populations. Uh, population, that's why I'm saying 20. So plant out clumps, uh, allow them to have uh, bees, pollinators, wind, or whatever, uh, um, that you have fertile individuals that, that can, can produce seed, and then they go, you go from there. Uh, and then you make, uh, make mixtures out of that. That would be my recommendation. But it's not informed by good experimental data. I have to add to that. Uh, Sherry wants to know, and you could, I'm sure, talk at length about this, um, but what is the issue with earthworms? 
<laughs> uh, we spent half a webinar on that. Um, the issue with earthworms is that they change um, the uh, ecosystem processes of nutrient cycling and the uh, uh, and what we consider soil. So they decrease through their feeding effort. They increase decrease the litter level. With the decrease in litter level uh, or litter layer, uh, all the organisms that live in a litter layer that could be lots of little cribbly crawlies, but also salamanders or birds that nest in the, uh, uh, in, in the leaf litter, they go away because their food goes away. Uh, then you get increased erosion, um, um, particular on, on hillsides. So the earthworms basically mobilize the topsoil and it's being washed down in heavy uh, rain events. So they have wholesale changes in the way that ecosystems are operating. There will be a new paper coming out pretty soon where we have summarized that. It will come out in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution. We just got that accepted uh, about the way that earthworms change trophic cascades. Um, hopefully that will come out in 2019, but uh, uh, that is a, is a new view on, on uh, where decomposition or the tritovores, as we call earthworms, are actually uh, affecting uh, ecosystems and their function. Neo wants to know if fencing will reduce seed dispersal and that uh, are there many or any plant seeds that are dispersed via deer? So are deer essential for the dispersal of certain plants? No. Do deer help in dispersal? For some, yes. Very often it's uh, introduced species that they do. So you can find them in, in deer dung. Uh, uh, they can also disperse trilliums if they eat a trillium at the time that the seed is ripe. Um, but fences um, do not discourage dispersal from the inside out. They discourage dispersal from the outside in for invaders. That seems to have happened for a number of species. So we have, we have seen areas that were previously fenced. Microstegium comes in. It doesn't invade into the fences other than right at the edge. I've seen it for some other species. There are some interactions with earthworms and the changes that earthworms are generating that disfavor some introduced species. It's not uh, across the board, but that's what we're seeing. Um, but the dispersal vectors for... If you have large enough fences that uh, turkeys can fly in, other birds can fly in, uh, raccoons, skunks, foxes, others will come in, and, and so you will have your dispersal vectors there. Uh, so it wouldn't discourage from the outside, uh, from the inside out. Okay. Tessa wants to know if there's been any data collected once a fence is removed, and um, so what do the deer do? Once the fence is removed. <laughs> so I don't have collected those data, but maybe you can answer it, Peter. Uh, I don't. I don't have that data. I would. I mean, I would guess that they would go in uh, to the area, and it's. It's um, there's, you know. And people do that in the freaking forest all the time, right? Um, so what what foresters typically have done, if they can't regenerate because of high deer browse pressure. They fence them for a decade or longer, and then they can take the fences away because often the re-sprouts or the, 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 the saplings that were planted are out of deer browse height. Sometimes right. it needs to be more than a decade. Um, and then the deer would come back in, and they would just eat whatever is there. Whatever they can access. So the, so the herbaceous plants that, you know, mostly right. what you were talking about would be vulnerable once again. Absolutely. So uh, it's, a, it's a temporary protection that affords certain species to escape out of what, uh, as I said, Don Waller called the molar zone, and everybody else will be vulnerable. Uh, it will take them a while to learn that there's no longer a fence, uh, but um, then they will all go in and find uh, for a while paradise in there. Yes. Um, Joan 
notices that besides exclosure projects that more needs to be done to control deer populations and wants to know if you have any suggestions. In, in terms of deer control, is that the question? Yes. So the, the deer populations are need to be yeah. controlled. And so with the, the, the exclosures reduce the impact, but that yeah. doesn't change the deer population. So what about changing the deer population? Yeah. So, um, Again, uh, that, that's the story for an entire webinar. Uh, let me just try to do it in a minute. Um, there is no chance for anything other than lethal removal. If you don't remove lethally, um, uh, populations will not go down. Um, and and uh, if you sterilize the organisms that are sterilized, will still eat. So there's no chance for that. We have done that at Cornell and other places. Um, lethal removal requires you to um, have uh, permits to shoot more deer than are being taken right now. And how that is being regulated in, uh, is depending on what state you are in. Um, so I have the most experience, obviously, with New York, where we have what's called nuisance permits or deer depredation permits. Uh, if you can show an impact, you can then... Um, asks the Department of Environmental Conservation for uh, permits to take more deer where it wouldn't be limited how many uh, deer an individual can take once you go to these these nuisance permits in other states there may be other approaches um, that has helped a little bit I don't know what it can uh, get to um, the the deer reduction that you need to have if it's just about a local area you may be able to do something with uh, with these nuisance permits, um, but it's tough overall to manage deer. We will have uh, have to have changes in uh, in the regulations. Maybe even bring back regulated market hunting so that people that shoot deer can sell venison or bring it to a butcher, so that we encourage a much much larger reduction in deer numbers on the landscape than what we're seeing right now. That's a political nightmare to push through, but without that, uh, we will continue to rely on uh, on fences for quite a while. That's why I think this is a, this is a band aid, but not an ultimate solution. We can't fence everything. And I'm more than happy to talk more if uh, the Joan. Um, I, I don't remember what options are possible, and I would need to know where where she's located. Andy wants to know what size, what, are the, what wants to know the size of the areas that you fenced, that you showed the data for, and if fencing single plants is beneficial. Um, so the areas that we have fenced, I showed uh, in, in one slide that we started with 30 by 30 meters at West Point, because that was about as much as we could afford when we had, it was a million dollar project anyway, uh, so we had it professionally installed because I didn't know how to do it. Um, and those fences were pretty straight and, uh, and fine. But uh, then I said, oh, I can do that differently and much cheaper with my students. And so we went to 50 by 50, and that didn't capture a lot of the edge effects. So the areas that we have uh, fenced now are two hectares or five acres. Um, some of them are square, some of them are rectangular. What I showed you here was from these five, uh, five, five acre plots. I would fence as much area as you can. Um, there is uh, obviously a maintenance issue, um, but larger is better. Okay. Uh, Francis was uh, struck by your comment about stilt grass, says that, um, I can't agree with the statement that excluding deer will cause microstegium or silt grass to be reduced. Once to know about your data, it says we have stilt grass invasions and deer exclosures that simply get worse and worse. Um, I need to know how big her exclosures are. Uh, if you do it at uh, 10, 10 meters square or 10 square meters or so, that will not work. Uh, we can show, I can show her the data. I actually showed her, showed her, showed one, see what I can get back. It's pretty close here. Um, we have done the experiments. Other people have done the experiment. Oh, this is right where it is. 
So this is, it, this is it here. These are 30 by 30 meter exclosures at West Point, the lowest one, uh, and microstegium goes away. Doesn't say it's gonna be eradicated, but it goes away to very, very low cover. So on the left side here is cover if she's still uh, looking at this. Um, there's the paper that summarizes that. We are not the only people showing this. There's a whole bunch of other folks that have shown the same thing. So the so the size of the you think the size of the exposure would matter? That would uh, absolutely. So well. if you were to have like a meter square or so, uh, that will that will not work. And I think the way that this happens is through the interaction of deer with earthworms. So if you think about the dispersal ability of an earthworm, if you have a, a one meter square area of or even five by five or 10 by 10 meter, earthworms can go in and have this edge effect very, very quickly. That's why we recommend these huge areas where, um, where you affect not only the deer browse, but also the indirect facilitation of the deer on the earthworms. And that's how still grass goes away. Okay. So Daniel says, I work in a suburban area in southeastern New York with a lot of invasive plants. We have a fenced five acre area to remove deer and have done some restoration. Unfortunately, I have a high abundance of several invasive and a huge stilt grass problem because the area chosen, chosen was next to a parking lot. They do <laughs> invasive removals inside the fences to keep abundance down. What's your recommendation for continued management? Uh, do you think this is a waste of time? I'm assuming that to remove whether or not removing the invasive. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure about it, and I'm not sure how long this has been in existence. Uh, so, um, if he wants to talk to me directly, uh, <clears throat> Daniel, send me an email, and we can go about that. So I would. So if he's on still, you can see that it takes years for microstegium to go away. I would not manage microstegium on the inside because the soil disturbance that you create may facilitate still grass uh, recruitment from the seed bank. Uh, if you spray or do other things, that may facilitate invaders. This does not go for, if he's in, uh, in, in, in southern New York, he may have to deal with a lot of vines or with, uh, with honeysuckles. Those would expand some after reduced uh, uh, reduced deer abundance, so it really and maybe the same with barberry because the deer keep some uh, invasive plants in check. Um, so, uh, so I'm I'm not entirely sure what he has there without additional information, but I'm more than happy to talk to him about it uh, to see whether it's a wasted effort or whether there is some patience that may be required or a change in the way that they're approaching it. So that's, I maybe didn't enunciate that's Danielle. So it's, oh, I'm sorry. She, that's, yeah, a, yeah, no, yeah. that's okay. And I put Baron's email at the, into the chat. I guess I should have asked before I did that, Baron, but no, no, that's fine. So people can, people can find me. I know, I know. I'm not hidden on the web. <laughs> All right. Um, so Mariana wants to know if fencing will affect small mammals that cannot cross it. Some of those species might be beneficial or even protected themselves. So this is the interesting thing uh, for me when I talk about fences, and I'm going to put another slide back up. I'm talking about these kind of things that you see in the upper corner. We use plastic fencing. Uh, that allows us to install it really easy, repair it really easy, and allow us all kinds of critters to go in and out. Um, so um, rodents, snakes, others have no problems crossing this. Uh, the medium, well, small, medium-sized mammals, whether these are foxes, skunks, raccoons, squirrels, um, they will actually chew a hole into the fence at the bottom um, and have the ability to use the usual uh, corridors that they use or paths. Um, and that's just fine with me because I want them in and out. I, don't, I want them to be able to, to live in there, but the deer don't get through that. Um, some people even install um, like tires uh, or other places where they have a small uh, area that they leave open for these organisms to, to uh, go in and out. 
Um, so uh, there may be some dispersal that is being affected, but uh, I don't have the quantification for it, but it's not a true exclusion. Okay. Um, Eli, Eli wants to know, you mentioned this, maybe you'll defer to an earlier comment. Uh, the question is if you should just pick in terms of allocating resources, if you should pick the species where your efforts will have the greatest return, um, irrespective of the rarity of the species. That's not a decision that I can make in a, in a general term. So if you are an individual landowner, a state park, a municipality, you should um, make a decision of where you want to focus. Just because you know it can be done doesn't mean you should actually do it and ignore something where other spe people had some difficulties. Um, and so if you just have two triums left somewhere, should you fence a huge area? I probably wouldn't. Um, if you just have one or a couple of orchids left somewhere, should you fence a huge area? My decision probably wouldn't putting a big, big fence around it. I would still may want to protect them, um, but I don't, I don't know whether it's a waste of time. Sometimes what we have done by putting larger areas under fencing, we discovered that we had organisms in there that we didn't know about whether that was ginseng, whether that was other orchids, uh, species show up surprisingly that were not discovered before. Um, but how to prioritize, that's an exercise that each landowner, each organization needs to go through and say, well, we would like to do this or we'd like to do that. Um, I wouldn't want to interfere with that local decision making. Okay. Derek wants to know if there are any negative consequences of fences that should be considered. Uh, and maybe it's an issue of the size of the enclosed area. So negative effects. Um, sometimes if you have large fences that are at on slopes, you could see that uh, litter may accumulate on the down slope side of fences. Um, but that's a negative effect other than its annoyance if a fence is being pulled down because material is moved in that way. Uh, that would be one of them. I have, uh, I have seen um, a couple of bird strikes in them. Um, that is... Uh, um, that's why we put these uh, white flags in there that you can see on the on this slide uh, to alert organisms to the existence of uh, of a new obstacle in the woods, um, and then and then they learn. Um, I'm not aware of other aspects. The dispersal uh, issue is something that you occasionally see. Uh, people may think about some snakes that can get stuck into. Uh, into smaller sized uh, 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 netting. The, the one that we use here, I think it's two inches at a side. So that's pretty good. Although, you know, if a snake is just the right size and tries to wiggle through that, that may be difficult. Um, but this is not something that is happening frequently. Okay. Lisa wants to know if it's uh, about the option to plant deer browse to divert uh, the deer from the species you'd like to protect? <laughs> no, that doesn't work. Um, so, and I wouldn't know what the protocol would be for that. Um, very often if you plant something, let's say a hunter plants a food plot uh, of, uh, you know, they do that all the time. Um, and so you attract the deer, most likely the species that would be vulnerable to deer browse that are um, most closely to these places where deer are being fed are hammered more than the ones that are further away. So we have, I think there's a paper about that for deer. I know there's papers about that for moose in Sweden and others where it's more common that deer are being fed. I don't know what people have looked at uh, 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 food plots for hunters and what native species would do. Uh, that's, that's not a useful exercise. 
Sherry wants to know if there are rankings of threatened species for a given area. So like the state natural heritage programs or nature conservancies, or are I'm there other sure groups? everybody would... has those. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that there, there are species lists that are in existence at various level from the federal down to sometimes local. Um, and it would depend on where she is to actually get a hold of that. Heritage programs may have that. Um, municipalities may have that. It really depends on where you are. I know that some counties in the Midwest, they have much stronger uh, county conservation organizations than what we typically find out in, in the East. They may have their own lists. Um, so that would uh, require a little bit of digging, but those things should be out there. Okay, and there are some, because it's 1.30 and there are some statements, not questions, I'm not going to read those to you. Um, have you looked at rodent increases inside exclosures after excluding the predators of those rodents? So I personally have not, uh, and we are not excluding predators. So there are snakes, there are owls. Um, uh, I don't think coyotes would go in, but uh, foxes go in. Um, and so what people have seen is that you can get an increase in rodent abundance, but not necessarily in rodent damage after exclosures have been up for a while because you have more of a diverse vegetation mix on the inside. So um, <clears throat> people have done that for elk exclosures and some deer exclosures, um, but uh, it's not increasing the damage that the rodents do. And I can tell from my from my own work where we have planted oaks inside and outside of exclosures to actually measure deer browse intensity. Uh, and we do not see an increased rodent attack on the inside compared to the outside, uh, even after many years. Um, however, if you get into places where you have a lot of rodents because there's very little vegetation, it only takes a couple of days for a rodent to take out the oaks that you planted. Um, and uh, so uh, it's a combination then of, of deer and oaks, but we don't see an, an increase in, uh, uh, in rodent impact on vegetation on the inside. Okay. Then what appears to be the last uh, question or comment is about uh, the relative benefits of hunting versus uh, sterilization, deer sterilization programs. No benefit of sterilization unless the deer population or the deer herd is fenced. Um, so that's the first thing. Hunting does not affect, at least not in the way that it's being done right now, uh, does not affect the deer population to, the, um, to an extent that's measurable in terms of their impact. Uh, we know that for oak regeneration, uh, unless you have a particular good group of people that hunt in a certain area. Um, we have measured that at Cornell. We have seen it in other places. Hunters give up before you see the effect that's needed to affect uh, forest recruitment or uh, uh, native species that are of conservation concern if they are vulnerable uh, to deer browse. It's, uh, it's not working. Um, we see the... Uh, least or a reduced amount of damage in state forests that are heavily hunted here in our area, but it's the reduction in deer browse intensity on oaks or, or other species is not large enough to prevent the slow erosion. It slows down the loss of diversity, but it can't prevent it. So hunting in the way it's being done right now, and I know that for New York is not helping. Um, it's just, just a tiny little bit. Very well done, Baron. Thank you. And there were lots of people that said, you know, very nice things about all that you were presenting. So, okay. Thanks. Do I see that in the comments section? 
uh, in the chat window. Yes. So there's, you know, thanks. Great information. Thanks for a great program. Yeah, I will just scroll through that and then yes. I, I can, thank, I can see the thank comments. You. Yes. I just didn't want it to read while I was answering. No, I, and I was, so I was trying to, you know, I'm trying to read and listen to you at the same time, which is not always easy. So yeah. I'll uh, call this webinar to a close. And I want to thank Baron. And we, I think you hit a peak of about 211 viewers. So that's, uh, that's quite impressive. And Baron will be back at seven o'clock tonight if you want to um, see, see this presentation again. Okay. So, Peter, am I still able to listen uh, or, or look through that? Will you keep it open for me? Um, so I saved it. Okay. And I can send that to you. Yeah. Well, there have been a bunch then of more. I scroll, then I can scroll to the comments and you can go yes. to the webinar. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, because I have to run out to the R not now. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Baron. I'll see you yeah, back. Thank, at thank you very much. 6.55 tonight. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye.